and welcome back to the Across the Pod NFL podcast. The 2002 season is now complete as the Kansas City Chiefs are the Super Bowl champions after their win over the Philadelphia Eagles on Sunday night. And my guest today is a fan who was on the preview of the game last week. A returning guest who was on our season preview episode back with us is Eagles fan Steve. First of all, um, obviously you, you guys lost on the Sunday. Have you recovered yet? If I'm entirely honest, no. Um, it it doesn't. It's not as raw as it was um, on kind of Monday, Tuesday. I took Monday off work, uh, and I just like shut down all my social media because you know all of us in the NFL community are big friends. But when your team loses and it loses a Super Bowl, everyone is merciless. There was no oh commiserations. Ah, oh, so sorry. Oh, you need to uh, if you lose. It's just abuse. I mean, I will say I did actually send you a text um, saying commiseration. So I um, I will just put that out there that I did send that text. You, but, did, um, you, you broke the trend. Every other message I had was unrepeatable <laughs> on this podcast. I think, I do think most neutrals were, it's, I think it was quite a mix because I think, I think the majority was probably in favour of the Eagles because people, you know, they know Mahomes is going to get there again, but you never know with the Eagles. So I think that, you know, I think there was a majority of neutrals that weren't, NFC East teams fans that probably were cheering on the Eagles. Um, I think I think this was in terms of the the supporters kind of going one way or This is probably one of the most kind of balanced Super Bowls we've had in a long time. You didn't have everyone one side or the other. Um, and like you said, for a neutral, if you weren't a fan of either team, this was probably one of the best Super Bowls ever. It was so much fun to watch. But if you were a fan of either of those teams, this was just. It was difficult to watch. I mean, I said before that I don't know how people who support the good teams like the Patriots, for example, have done it over the years because I've seen us play two games in the playoffs all my life. One of them was over within the first quarter, but the one I had to experience it was I was so nervous. That was not, you know, that's not even that's just one game. And to have it again and again and again and in such big games to make it all the way, I just can't imagine what your nerves were like. And to have it, uh, well, I'm guessing three times in your lifetime you've seen the Eagles in the Super Bowl. Um, and that's, I don't know how you do it because it's just an incredibly, incredibly tense experience. But um, yeah, unfortunately, mm-hmm. did on, on the losing end. Um, we'll see. We were, we had, we are going to go through the end of the podcast. Our predictions from the start of the season. And Luke mm-hmm. isn't here, but you will see him later on in the week for his his tales of his if of his experience at Super Bowl in Arizona. He of course went to the game. If you hadn't listened to our podcast last week, um. We thought sort of we'll, we'll skip content a little bit to one of our first talking points will be to do with where that Super Bowl ranks in terms of the NFL greats because I did an article on this the other day or came out today actually about a couple of hours ago about would I rank this Super Bowl in a top five, top ten. And if I'm honest, I wouldn't put it in a top five at all because as great as a game was, the one takeaway everyone's going to remember from this game is the holding call. And I think you look at the great games, look at the Malcolm Butler interception with the Patriot Seahawks, you look at the Joe Montana drive against the Bengals in Super Bowl in 1989, whatever it was. You look at the the Philly, Philly special and the Eagles won it in 2017. You look at the the Ian's the Giants Patriots when they you know they stopped the Patriots being the first unbeaten team who went 19 and 0. Um, I think you look. I think there's a lot of recency bias. People are calling it the best ever. I think there's a lot of recency bias in this game. People are looking at this game because it's so recent. But I think you look back in five years' time, I think this game will sadly be tarnished by by the holding call. Um, we will mention that in a bit, actually, as well. But in terms of this game, where would you rank it? Would you put it as the best ever, one of the best five ever? Where would you sort of rank this Super Bowl amongst the previous 56? I think that the problem for something like that, when you're asking a fan of one of the teams that played, is especially the team that lost, um, how would you rank it? Uh, I would rank it as probably the most nervous I've been watching the Eagles at any point in the last 30 years. Um, even like in the previous Super Bowls, uh, when we played the Patriots and, and you know, when we played the Patriots, you're supposed to be playing the Patriots in Super Bowls uh, until this time. Um, yeah, I just, I, I said earlier, for the neutral, this was great. It was a, te- a game where both teams couldn't stop scoring uh, and high scoring Super Bowls are always great fun to watch. But, Again, it didn't have that defining play other than the, the holding call, which gave the, the Chiefs the, 
and, and arranged for the field goal. Um, there was also a lot of controversy over the pitch, which should never be talked about during a Super Bowl. You know, you have the whole year to get that field perfect for the biggest game of football, you know, of the year. And you don't. You you get it completely wrong. The pitch, the, the pitch, especially in the center and over the painted areas, it was like watching Washington play at home. I have not seen a field that bad in a long time. And, you know, whoever's in charge of that needs to hold their hands up and say, you know what, I got that wrong. Uh, and then if I need to look at it and say, if you can't deliver, you know, they delivered everything else. I mean, Luke and, and Chris and so on, and friends of mine who are there, they'll tell you that the experience of the day was, was fantastic. Um, everything went smoothly in the stadium. But on the field, which is where it matters, which is where the world is watching, the pitch just that the field was not up to Super Bowl standard. And that I think will be what people remember this for, not just the bad call. Yeah, and it's not as if it's a stadium that you know hasn't had one before. I had the Patriots Seahawks one, I had the uh Steelers Cardinals one in 2009. You know, it's not a stranger to a Super Bowl Super Bowl event or even just hosting the NFL game. And it's um it was a shame that that was one of the main talking points. Uh but of course the main talking point of the game we just mentioned then was the holding call. It was late on. The Eagles, um, sorry, the Chiefs were on third down. There was about a minute and a half left of the game. Eagles had one timeout still, you know, and the call came from James Bradbury, you know, allegedly holding on to Juju Smith Suster. And even though Bradbury's come out and said he was holding, um, I personally disagree. And I don't I think it was incredibly soft, and I don't think it was enough of a hold to um to personally be a foul in such a such a big game. It's an awful shame that that has really been the main talking point, but obviously you had a massive horse in a race when it came to this game, but what was your take, uh, first of all, when you were watching it, but also in the days that have passed since um, it happened, has your mind changed since the time, or do you still think it was as bad as you were saying to me on, on Sunday night? I think that the problem with this game was that the referees had, they'd obviously been told before the start of the game, let the players go out and play football, right? So we hadn't seen holding calls, we hadn't seen, you know, Bad blocks. We hadn't seen you know roughing the pass. We hadn't seen there were some pretty big hits, uh, and a couple of them probably you could have said that was unnecessary roughness. But they'd been told to let the players play. So to have a game like that, which is so open, and the refs are just letting letting things go because it's it's all action. It's great for people to watch. To have it, you know, ruined on what was it, it was a hold, but it was you know it was a it was a ticky tacky kind of thing. There were dozens of those all through the game, which were uncalled on both sides, and. I don't know why it is the refs with like a minute and a half left decided now is the time we need to actually start enforcing something we've been letting go for the entire game. You know, um, it, it, there's a great shot. I think you'll probably have seen it in various places of uh, a couple of face mask calls that the Chiefs just got away with. And I I can't criticise the refs for letting those face mask calls go because that that was how they've been told to let things up, let things be, let the game unfold, let the players play the Super Bowl, let the players win the Super Bowl, don't have referee involvement. So for them to have, I, I, again, it's that refereeing inconsistency that drives fans mad. When a ref can have a really good game for three quarters and then, you know, just decide in the fourth quarter, I'm going to decide to referee completely differently to how I have the whole previous game. That's what I know has annoyed the fans. That's why people are like, that feels as though that, that call screwed us and it feels intentional. Um, but, you know, that's it, it's a bit conspiracy theorist because obviously Bradbury's come out and said, you know what, I it was a hold. I didn't think they had called on it. I did. Hands up. Fair play to him. Um, but I, I, it's one of those, if the refs are going to be calling very, very minor things, I would rather have seen them be consistent from the first quarter to the last as opposed to, you know, it was just terrible. I mean, I think we we had six or seven penalties over the course of the game, um, and every single one of them up until that point, I'd said, yeah, that's that's fair and it's obvious. You know, the little things that you know interrupt the flow of play, they weren't being called, which is how it should be. You should let a game be played, um, and just to have that one, which you know, that the worst thing about it was, did you see Juju on Twitter after that? Was it the thing with AJ Brown? Sorry. Was it the, yeah, yeah, it was AJ Brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't just AJ Brown. He he has pissed off a lot of people, and not just Philly fans. It's Why like, am I not shocked? Why am I you, not shocked? It's like you won a Super Bowl on like a one year deal where your career was saved by Mahomes because you were about to be you've been displaced in in Pittsburgh by uh by two better receivers, 
and you come out and you start acting the big man and it's like he is going to go out next season and every team that plays against him is going to target him. He is going to be put on the sidelines. Uh, and I suspect wherever he goes next season, if he stays at Kansas, if he stays at Kansas, I don't think he'll stay on a long-term deal. He didn't show enough in that game to get a long-term deal. Um, but wherever he goes, he's going to be one of the most unpopular players in the league. And I know you kind of ride for your boys if they're, they're one of your teammates, but I think even even in the most friendly locker rooms, Juju is going to be an outcast. Yeah, I mean, I will say in his defence, there was that the one drive leading up to the the eventual holding the whole or the inverted commas holding call and 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 the field goal. I think he had some big catches in that, but I think you know the whole season he's only had three touchdowns all season. You know, he remember in the COVID year he was annoying a lot of people with his TikTok dancing. I think he danced on the Bengals logo and things like that. And I think he's no stranger to that. But of course, he's got the ring and that's all that matters. But I actually wanted to, this is a fantastic segue into my next question, is that Melvin Gordon is good, going to get a ring and he's not played a single snap for the Chiefs. Now, do you think something should change about that? Because it feels a bit, it feels a bit hollow for him probably that he's going to get this ring despite actually having no real impact on the field in a Super Bowling team. And then you see a lot with the Champions League. You see, you know, the whole squad, like third choice keepers getting Champions League winners medals. I mean, do you think it should go to just anyone who goes to both sports? Do you think it should, just, it should now just in the future only go to those who've actually played on the field or had some sort of role? Do you think that people who have not played a single minute in the whole of the run-up to the Super Bowl, do you think um, someone like Melvin Gordon deserves to get a ring or do you think he, um, or do you think he, he maybe he shouldn't get one? I'm going to give this two two points on this one. The first one is uh, I love Melvin Gordon. Uh, I thought Melvin Gordon, when he came through uh, with the Chargers, I thought he was going to be one of the, be- the best big things. I think he made a massive mi- miscalculation in holding out on his deal with the Chargers. I think he should have stayed because he was he was their number one back. Eckler was his number two. He was holding Eckler up, but he was offered more money than he should have been offered. Any running back should have been offered at that time because it was during the period when Todd Gurley was resetting the market. Um, he went out and he started taking short-term and one-year deals, etc., just to kind of like, you know, re-establish himself, prove that he was still worthy. Um, and when he came to Kansas, uh, one thing you can't underestimate is the, the effect him and McKinnon had on Isaiah Pacheco, right? Having experienced um, backs in who have been there, done it, played against the big teams, played in the big games yeah to you know guide your rookie through you know his first season in the league and let's be honest Pacheco has had a very good first season in the league um I think personally he's displaced Edwards Hilaire quite easily this season as their, their lead back um I you can't underestimate that kind of you know effect that it's had on the player so in that respect for what he's given off the field to the Chiefs um if he was part of that 52-man squad he deserves a ring yeah, he put a good case forward. Um, I wanted to put out that I did actually, before the season started, wrote an article saying how Pacheco could be one of the biggest draft steals this year, and I think he's proved to be exactly that. Sixth or seventh round, he had a big impact on the game. Of course, there is Tony as well, someone who was completely written off with New York um, in the Giants, has come to the Chiefs and become what ended up being a big part of the win. I think that, that run he made you know, in the, in the kick return would end up being huge. And I think that he is someone else that's really resurrected their career. Um, in terms of the on, game... On Kadiri's Kadir Tony, I just want to say, I, and those of us who watch it here on the island, we're a small community, but we kind of, we, we know our players. Uh, we've all said for a very long time that Tony was a very, very good player. Mm. And it wasn't that he was bad in New York. It was he was badly coached and he wasn't in a system that suited him. Um, you know, I think if they played him much more as a kind of short yardage player until he got his confidence up, played him in the slot um, for like the first six games, get to know the system, I think he could have been a much bigger weapon for them. But, you know, that's on the Giants. That's poor coaching on your, your wideouts. And, you know, and you ask any Giants fan, that's been their, their Achilles heel for years. They get a good, a really naturally gifted wide receiver in, and then the coaching is terrible and he fades within a couple of seasons um, or he gets traded to Cleveland. <laughs> so, you know, the, this is a Giants problem. And if I, you know, if the Giants were to go out this off season and hire anyone, it would be hire a wide receiver coach that can develop your wide receivers because the amount of talent that has come in and out of that franchise is phenomenal. Uh, and Tony, fair play to him. That, that punt return was excellent. Stopped on a dime 
probably the only player of the whole game that did, given the state of the field. Uh, made a run back, you know, brought it back right the way up. It, it was tremendous. Um, and yeah, so you know, scored a receiving touchdown as well. Uh, him and Sky Moore, Sky Moore, who hasn't had the best of debut seasons, uh, should never be allowed to return a punt ever again. Right. If you ask any Chiefs yeah. fans, um, yeah, and I just fair play to him. Uh, he's he will be if I if I'm Andy Reid and I'm sitting going through contracts and I'm saying I can have Kadarius Tony still on his rookie deal, yeah. So I can have Kateri's Tony here for another couple of years and not pay him, uh, or I can pay Juju Smith-Schuster another $10 million next year. I'll tell Juju to go back to Pittsburgh or wherever else he thinks he can get a deal. Um, that'll free me up some cap space to uh, to add to my my the rest of the, the team, which, to be honest, was... <sighs> I want to say it was the, the pitches, for the field's fault that we couldn't get the Mahomes, but I have to give so much credit to that Kansas O-line. I mean, that's an O-line that all season... You know, has been porous. Mahomes has been on the move, um, and it was just really stout. It was so solid. Um, you know, we we the fact we didn't not just didn't didn't get a sack on Mahomes. We didn't touch him. We didn't touch him the whole game. You know, and that was our pass rush giving it everything they had in the Super Bowl. So, fair play to him. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it really y'all get a lot of credit because this Eagles defense. We mentioned it in the preview episode, and I mentioned it before about how good it was. I mean, four players on double-digit sacks. I mean, it's a, it was the best defense in the league, the third most sacks um, in any sort of season. I think only the Bears in 84, 85, um, and the Vikings in 89 have had more sacks in the season as a unit than um, this Bears, this um, Eagles team. They had the chance to have the most sacks in postseason history, but obviously they didn't get any sacks in this game. And, you know, uh, Mahomes, you know, came back from an injury and, you know, had one of his most iconic performances today to have the injury he had and came back out the second half a different player and I think that you look at on the flip side Jaden Hurts you know he also had three rushing touchdowns had over I believe over 300 yards in this game as well I mean first of all how much can you you got to you got to credit the homes and how good he played but also that Hurts performance is that the best ever one of the best ever quarterback losing Super Bowl performances you've seen yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, as far as my homes goes, um, I will take, you know, a bucket full of whatever drugs they pumped him full of at halftime because he came out at halftime looking like he could run through walls and he went off at halftime looking like he couldn't walk. Mm. So, you know, that, that Chiefs treatment room, yeah, some great work done there, but there's also, I think, a ton of anti-inflammatories injected directly into various places. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, it hurts. Uh, the only downside to Hurts pretty much in the last six weeks has been the fact that you can see he's still a little limited in his shoulders. Um, best example of it was when that yeah, that big touchdown throw to AJ Brown, mm. and you could see he underthrew that ball and Brown had to make the adjustments. Um, and even when it came down to like the last play of the game, you could see Hurts just doesn't have the, the he doesn't have the distance in his arms. Um, but everything else about his game, um, it's so like Cunningham, it's so like Vic. You know, and it's uh, as someone who grew up with that quality of quarterback, uh, you know, at the Eagles, I just, I, I didn't, I mean, I was one of the people who, from the first season, genuinely doubted him. I didn't think, I thought, he's another mobile quarterback. Yeah, great. But does he have the accuracy? Can he make the reads? You know, and I thought he's just, you know, we had a quarterback who was mobile and, and a bit taller and, and could make the reads, uh, but he was made of glass. He was called Carson Vince, and we gave him a big deal. And that was, you know, it all fell apart. I worry a little bit that we might do the same here, but I don't know. Hertz just has a little bit more about him. He just doesn't feel like he's made of glass. Um, he feels he's a little bit more, a little bit more rugged. Um, his mobility is far, far better than Vince's was. Um, I, I know. Obviously, when you talk to Luke tomorrow, I'm sure you might mention to Luke about what he thinks of Justin Fields. Hurts is basically what Justin Fields could be if Justin Fields could read a defense. Um, he's just, you know, he can sit in the pocket, he can pick his passes, he's quite comfortable there, or he can take off and he can move with absolute lightning speed. Um, he's the prototype, I think, in the league right now for the mobile quarterback. Um, he's as good as Josh Allen is. Uh, maybe doesn't have the arm strength of Josh Allen. Um, he's better. I hate saying this because my, my friend who's a massive Ravens fan will not be happy. He is better than Lamar Jackson is and he's only in his third season. Um, uh, and he is 
And I don't care what you think, Luke. He is considerably better than Justin. I'm a rushing. I'm a. I'm a running back. Fields. Well, I will say I do think Justin Fields is playing like what Hurts is playing like before Hurts got AJ Brown. So I think that if the Bears were to go out, whether it's a free agency, whether it's a trade, or whether it's a draft, I think if you're gonna with the capital they've got and the and the draft picks they have and the the cap space they have, I think that they can do what the Bills did with Josh Allen, what we've done with Tua, and what the Eagles did with AJ Brown. Well, hang on, I need to stop you. What you've, done, what you've done with Tua? What okay. you've done with Tua? Destroy his career, <laughs> put him into a home full of handicaps. The man doesn't know where he is, and it's already February. He's still concussed. Okay, Tua is a bad example. <laughs> um. But yeah, I, I do think that um, if you give Fields a great receiver like AJ Brown, like Stefan Diggs, I do think we will see a similar progression. And we've already seen him progress from year one to year two. So I think that the Bears... It's, it's the Bears, good. right? The Bears have a whole pile of draft capital, which they will waste because that's what the Bears do. Yeah. The Bears, the Bears could not draft. If you literally gave them all 32 picks in the first round, the Bears could still screw up. <laughs> Do you think that if they'd gone to one draft, they'd have probably picked Justin, Justin Jefferson in the fourth round or something, or they would have not even picked him at all? You know, it's um, they've not, have they even had a good quarterback ever. I think their best is probably Jim McMahon or Jay Cutler, and I think that's that is really saying something because Jim McMahon was really carried by that defense in '85, and Jay Cutler's Jay Cutler. But Bills could generally be their best quarterback ever in terms of talent if if he if he progresses even more in his third and fourth year. I do think that. If if the Bears want to make a proper trade, right, they trade Justin Fields and a pick to get themselves a better, younger quarterback. Because there's a couple of quarterbacks out there right now who I think teams might want to move on from. Um, and I think they should be the kind of guys they're looking for. Given the way the Bears' offense is set just now, yeah, I would not be surprised to see the Bills try and uh, the Ravens try and swap uh, Lamar Jackson uh, and some oh. picks going back and forth there. I think oh. that would be... I think the Bears rate Jackson more than they rate Fields. Um, and I think the Ravens aren't going to pay Lamar what he wants. So I think he's going to be very much in the market this summer. Yeah, I do think... I, I don't see the Bears moving on for Fields, if I'm honest. Um, but I can see Jackson moving. Um, the question is, I don't know who to. I mean, a lot of talk of the commanders. I hope for the Dolphins' sake, he go to the NFC, just have one less callback to worry about. I mean, I think you look at the... It'd be good. I think it'd be great for the Falcons. Um, I think it'd be good for someone like them because they, 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 they like. I think the Mark Nota. I think he's used to their system. He just wasn't a good enough quarterback to do that. So I think that he is someone. I think Arthur Smith would love. I think. You know, I think them. I think the Commanders are getting a lot of um, a lot of love, a lot of um hype. Um, but I still think Taylor Heineke isn't as bad as what people are making out. So I do think that they they have got someone there. Who I think has got this is the this is the reason I think you're going to get um you're going to get uh Lamar Jackson's because it's cap space. I'm looking at teams right now. I'm looking at like the top five teams and who has all the cap room. So the Bears not only have all the picks, they have nearly a hundred million dollars in cap space. That's nearly twice as much as the nearest rivals, which is the Falcons, who've got fifty one million. Yeah, I'm looking around the teams that are quarterback hungry. There's really only the Falcons, the Bears. Maybe the Raiders. I don't know what they're going to decide they're going to do. Um, definitely not the Giants. The Texans. Oh, the Texans. I don't generally know what's going on there. Um, yeah, I, I think it's there's, there's going to be a free agency pickup by either the Bears or the Falcons at quarterback. Possibly the Raiders. Um, if Lamar's in the market, Lamar's in the market. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting to see whether what he'll do. And I think, you know, I think we saw the big move last season being Russell Wilson in the offseason quarterback wise. And I do think Lamar Jackson, I think we'll see Derek Carr. Obviously he's now going, he's been released by the same by the Raiders, Jimmy Garoppolo. And I think that Lamar Jackson will be the biggest, the biggest headline, um headline move. Um but now we're gonna head to our final segment, which is going to be um going back over our predictions. So if, if any of you are old school listeners to the podcast, you would know that Steve joined the podcast back in August or September, whenever it was, to predict the season. We predicted that all the vid divisions one to four, as well as some categories going into the season. So again, Luke can't be here, but we will be going through his predictions as well. Um, what we're doing, we'll go through each each division and we'll give it um, a point per correct prediction in terms of standings in the division. 
And then going on, we will give points if you got a correct team who were the wildcard team. And also then um, we've got Patrick's MVP surprise team, biggest disappointment, and all these ones giving three points if it's correct, one point if they were close to being this, and then zero points if they were way off. And in the end, we will find out who has won our second edition of this Predictions Award show. Our winner last year was Steve. He did win the predictions last year, so he'll be hoping this year he can he can retain his title. So going on to the AFC, and first of all, the AFC East, which obviously finished, the Bills finished first with a 13-3 and record, the Dolphins second with 9-8, and Patriots third with 8-9, and and the Jets were seven and ten in fourth. So my prediction was a Bills, Dolphins, Patriots, and Jets uh, one to four ranking. So that is four points for me, and the same for Luke, who also had the same one to four ranking. <laughs> Steve, however, I remember this one. I remember this one. <laughs> he went for a Buffalo first a position, Jets fourth, but he had the Patriots finishing second and the Dolphins third. So he still gets two points, but he is um, already. Behind me and Luke. Um, so AFC... I know where we went. I know where we went to came to the playoffs. So I think I'll get some points back there. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know what's coming as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your hot take is coming, Andy. That's going to be fun to see. Oh, my hot take was actually was so close being right. I'm so I was I really wish it did come true. Um, AFC North. Now this is where it gets interesting. So AFC North, I had a one to four of. Baltimore, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland. So the table did finish. Cincinnati top with 12 and 4 record. Raven second with 10 and 7. Pittsburgh third with 9 and 8. And the Cleveland Browns fourth with a 7 and 10 record. So for my one, I only get two points because I got Baltimore and Cincinnati the wrong way around, but Pittsburgh and Cleveland bang on. In terms of Luke, uh, he had Cincinnati first, Baltimore second, Cleveland third, and Pittsburgh fourth. So he gets also two points. But Steve gets four as he got the exact same order as to how the AFC North turned up. So four points to Steve there. Um, next up is the AFC South. So this is one where this is the most interesting prediction out of all of them. So <laughs> it finished. Jacksonville top with nine and eight. Tennessee second with seven and ten. Colts third with a four, twelve and one record. And the Texans fourth with three and 13 and one record. I mean, we all had Houston bottom, so that is already a point to us there. We all had Tennessee second, but we all had them finish second to the Colts, and we all had the Jags third. So we all had the exact same <laughs> predictions for that table. So in the end, we all get two points for the Houston Texans and Tennessee Titans predictions. But, you know, it's a hollow point for the Titans because we all thought we'd lose to one of the worst teams of the division in the, in the whole league in their division. So not a great one there. And then the AFC West, the one that everyone was banging on about when the season started. It was the C and the Z Premier Division. I don't want to think of my prediction on this. It was very <laughs> wrong. <laughs> uh, well, finished the Chiefs top of the anti Bowl champions with a 14-3 and record. The Chargers second with a 10-7 and record. And then the Raiders third with 6-11. and And then the Broncos with 5-12. and Now, only one person had the Chiefs winning the division, and that was me. Um, so... I had the Chiefs, then the Chargers, then the Broncos, and then the Raiders. So that is two points for me. But it is sadly no points for either Luke or Steve, as Luke had a Chargers, Broncos, Chiefs, Raiders, and Steve had the exact same. So they also get no points. So that is the end of the AFC, which, as it stands, um, means that I totally leave with 10 points. Luke and Steve both have eight and we are going to head to a quick break and we will come back for our NFC predictions review and also our awards predictions review. So we'll see you guys in a moment. And now we are on to our NFC predictions. We are back from our break. And the first division is going to be the NFC East. And of course, Steve had the Philadelphia Eagles winning the division with the Cowboys second, the Commanders third and the Giants fourth. In a division that ended with the Eagles winning it with a 14-3 and record, the Cowboys second with 12-5, and the Giants third with 9-7-1 and one record and the Commanders with an 8-8-1 eight and eight and one record finishing fourth. So Steve gets two points for that one for getting the correct positions of the Eagles and Cowboys. Um, as will I, as I got the exact same prediction in terms of one to four. But Luke sadly gets no points, as he had a Dallas, <laughs> Philly, Commanders, Giants on top four. But in a division that ultimately was very good, uh, team made Super Bowl, three of the four teams made the playoffs, and you know, 
one team was really close to making it as well. So, yeah, all round, probably the best division all round in the league this year. Um, NSV North, now, we all, had, we all had a stinker, as we all had the Packers winning the division. But in the end, they finished third with a 8-9 and nine record. The Vikings won it with 13-4 and four record. The Lions came second with 9-8. and eight, And the Bears were bottom with a 3-14 and 14 record and the worst record in the league this season. So, yeah, myself, it was a Packers, Vikings, Lions, Bears. So one point for myself. Uh, Steve also gets one point for the exact same. But Luke gets none as he had Packers, Vikings, Bears and Lions. Um, so all because Luke is delusional and thinks the Bears are a good team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think they will be good, but definitely not this season. Um, the NFC South, probably the worst division this year in football, uh, if not second worst. Either way, it's the South division that's the worst. Um, Finnish Buccaneers winning it with 8-9, and nine, which is one of the worst winning teams I've ever seen in a division. And then all three teams had 7-10 and 10 record apart from the Bucks. So the Panthers were second, Saints third, Falcons fourth. Now we all get a point each for having the Falcons bottom. We all get a point each for having the Bucks first, but we all had the Saints finishing second and the Panthers finishing third. So we all get two points when it comes to this division. And then finally, the NFC West, we all get zero points in this one. Um, 49ers won it with 13 and four. Seahawks were second with nine and eight. The defending champion Rams had a five and 12 record. And Definitely the worst defending champion I've ever seen. And then the Cardinals at the bottom with a 4-13 and record. So we all had Rams winning it. We all had the Seahawks bottom, whereas we all had, um, well, I had and Luke had 49 a second and Cardinals third. And Luke and Steve had Cardinals second, 49 a third. So um, I'm probably going to our awards, our wildcard picks. So for this one, for the AFC, my ones were the Bengals, the Chargers and the Titans. So only one of those teams made it as a wildcard team, so one point there. Luke had the Broncos, Chiefs and Titans. Chiefs obviously won the whole thing, but they were a playoff winner rather than a wildcard team, so we get he gets no points there. And Steve gets one point as he had Baltimore making it as a wildcard team, but also had the Chiefs and the Broncos. So that is the AFC wildcard picks then. The NFC picks, in the end, were the Cowboys, the Giants and the Seahawks. Uh, only one person got a correct prediction in the whole thing, and that was Steve, as he had the Cowboys making it as a wildcard team, but also had the Cardinals and the Vikings. Whereas Luke had the Vikings, Eagles and 49ers, all division winners. Well done, Luke. Um, and I had the Saints, the Vikings and the Lions. And I was so close to that being correct. And I, you know, I was I was really cheering on the Lions, especially towards the end, because I was really hoping they would well, first the Seahawks would lose, and then in the end they did win against the Packers, but it wasn't enough. So you know that was almost almost a correct score. I think um, I think Dan Campbell being in charge there has made the Lions everybody's favorite second oh, team. You just you, you just want the Lions to win something now. So at the end of that round, um, as we go into our awards, it's close. Luke has ten, but I still lead the way with sixteen. Where Steve is just one behind with fifteen. Going into our final ones, which will be our awards. So. Surprise team was our first one. Um, again, three points for being bang on, one point for being close. So this one's a bit, bit uh, you could argue a bit controversial, maybe not. But I, I gave myself three points as I had the Lions being a surprise team. I think no one had them finishing nine and eight. No one had them finishing above the Packers. So I will give myself three points there. And I will also give Steve, sorry, Luke three points as he also had the Eagles as a surprise team. And I don't think many had them, apart from maybe Eagles fans had them going all the way. And then no points... No, 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 no. That is not a surprise team. A team that's won the division, like, you know, three of the last five seasons winning the division. Um, how is that a surprise in any way, shape, or form? Did anyone but you or Eagles fans have them winning, reaching the Super Bowl or even, you know, going far? Winning, think... winning the division and, and going to the championship game. Yes. I don't, did, I you don't... See the book... did you see the bookies odds at the start of the season? No, I didn't actually know. The Eagles were sixth favourite for the Super Bowl at the start of the year. Okay, well, so now I hit that. Sorry, Luke. <laughs> going down to a one. Um, I can give I can give you the lines. I'm not going to argue the lines. No one expected yeah. a nine and eight, almost making the playoff lines. But okay, oh that, wow, that changes things a little bit. And then Steve gets no points because he had the Saints being a surprise team, and they, I frankly, stunk up the joint. Um, That's fair. Yeah. Biggest disappointment. Uh, Steve had the Dolphins. I'm going to give you one point there because they almost had one of the biggest collapses in in, in season history. Was well, so eight and three, and then lost five in a row. You know, and we barely scraped past the um, Patriots on the last. Oh, sorry, the Jets on the last day. I'm I, I'm going to push for that being a three pointer on the basis of the Dolphins. Yeah. 
almost killing their quarterback twice. No, no, no. We we, we made it say that they were a disappointment as a franchise. Oh no, that 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 wasn't the rule. So, uh, <laughs> um, now I wish we could give minus points for this one, but Luke had his biggest disappointment being the Chiefs. So he gets. <laughs> I love to give him a minus two for that one, or minus ten thousand, but um, yeah, give him no points there. And I'm very proudly going to say myself three, as I had the Denver Broncos as my biggest disappointment. I think they were, apart from the Rams, yeah. the biggest disappointment. So I, yeah. I saw them live in London, and they were just horrible. Yeah. I mean, Jacksonville should have won that game. Um, I have no idea how the Broncos pulled that one out, but oh no, that was a. Pretty terrible season for them. But I think next season they're going to make the playoffs. I think they look much better without Hackett. And I think Russell Wilson with Sean Payton, I think that's a marriage that could work out well. Um, MVP. Now, only one person gets a point here, and that is myself, as I had Josh Allen, and he was one of the five nominated for MVP. Luke had Herbert, and Steve had Aaron Rodgers, so no points for either of them. Comeback player of the year, uh, myself and Steve both had James Winston, so that was a pretty... um, Pretty big zero for us. Um, no. I think Luke should be given three points here as he had CMC McCaffrey, and I think he should have been a winner. I'm I was so shocked Gina Smith won the award. I'd even given it to um oh, Saquon Park. I know I you can't give that to McCaffrey. I mean, you can't see a player who has played consistently at a high level having a really good season as a comeback. He's well, not he was he a... was he was in the three nominees for comeback player of the year. It was him, Gina I have no Smith, idea why. And... Because he it's like Two years of injuries in a row, um, you know, came back and was definitely the trade of the season. He really transformed that 49ers team. And Saquon Bark, I think, would have been a good chat. I think any of those two over Juno Smith, I don't think Juno Smith at all should have won that award. Um, but I'll give Luke a point then. I wish I could give him three because I think he was my pick for comeback player of the year. Uh, AFC champions, we all get zero points as myself and Steve have had the Bills and the Chargers, and the Luke had the Chargers. So, um, yeah, no points there as. No one reached the AFC Championship game or even further. NFC, um, myself and Luke both had the Buccaneers. But Steve gets three points as he correctly picked the Eagles to win this award. So fair play to Steve. That is a good a good one there. Um, Super Bowl champion, Steve gets a point as he had the Eagles and they narrowly lost in the Super Bowl. Luke had the Chargers, zero points. I had the Buccaneers, zero points. Um, defensive player of the year, both myself and Luke had Aaron Donald. Zero, but I'll give Steve a point because he had Miles Garrett who had the third most sacks this season. So I'll give Steve a point there. Offensive player of the year, no one really came out well on this one. Um, Steve and Luke both had Justin Herbert, and I had Mark Andrews who basically lost me a, lost me a fancy league in the final. So um, yeah, not sure I'm picking him again in my fancy league. I'm sure he'll be a um, player I'll severely reject in um, NFL drafts this year in fantasy. Um, now, we probably have the worst prediction of the whole one coming up next. So, offensive rookie of the year. I went for Romeo Dobbs, zero points. Luke went for Brees Hall, give him a point because he was looking like the favourite before his injury. But Steve went for Jalen Tolbert, who I don't remember seeing anything from <laughs> this year at all. <laughs> he he fell out of favour in, in uh, camp pre-season and he just never really got on the field. No, he I was don't... a healthy scratch, I think, in like five of the first seven games. So it's just something about the coaches that didn't, didn't take to how he performed the training camp, and that was how he was done. Yeah, no, it certainly didn't do anything. Um, defensive player of the year, I get one point for having nominee Aidan Hutchinson, who ended up losing out to Source Gardner. And both Steve and Luke had number one overall pick Trayvon Walker, who don't think was bad, but I don't think he was anything anything special. So didn't, didn't um, make the top five, I'm afraid. No. Um, I, and to be honest, if I had to say, I would have given. Um, I, I hate to say this as an Eagles fan. I would actually have given it to Kevin Kibido, uh mm. for the Giants, who I thought had an insanely good season. I mean, yeah. he transformed their pass rush. He was good. I still would have given the Source Gardner. I think Source Gardner was maybe the best cornerback in the whole league this season, and he's a rookie. So I think, for me, Source Gardner was the right pick. Talking of picks, our final prediction was first overall pick. So basically, we predicted... Who would get the first overall pick in 2023? Uh, albeit, <laughs> remember this. <laughs> yeah, and um, albeit we are aware that the draft is still to come and there may be trades, but as it stands, it was basically a, a prediction to try and say who'd be the worst team this season. So Stephen Luke get a point as they both had the Houston Texans, who had the second overall pick. But I am proud to say that I had the Chicago Bears as my pick for 
first oval pick, so I get three points there. So that's something I'm very proud of. I remember just how angry Luke was when you said you were taking the Bears. <laughs> it was hilarious. And I was proved right. So, um, you know, people who are looking for someone to write them for NFL content or present on NFL content, you know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> so this means results are in um, for our second our second edition of our predictions awards. So in third place with a lowly 14 points is Luke. And then the winner with 26 points as opposed to 22 with the runner up is, insert drum roll, is me. So uh, I go. crown this year with 26 points and 22 points goes to Steve. Um, but yeah, that is the end of the episode. We are going to do a few, we're going to do our episode tomorrow with Luke and he will be going through his experience in the um, his first ever Super Bowl. And also I'll be with Freddie Harper Davis on Sunday as we review the season as a whole. Uh, but yeah, first of all, thank you, Steve, for first of all coming on, but also being a big part of the series this year. It's been great fun coming on. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm pretty sure we shall talk a lot about sport over the next year or so. Uh, I'm looking forward to winning back that uh, prediction crown next year. <laughs> well, then let, let the battle commence. Um, I, this, this has been the Across the Pod NFL podcast. I've been Andy, this has been Steve, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.